There's the bell. Soccer is in session, presented by Kaiser Permanente. I'm your host, Jason Longshore. Thanks for joining us on the SDH Network. As always, Soccer is in session is presented by Kaiser Permanente. We care, we advocate, we give, we thrive. Thank you to Kaiser Permanente for helping us cover soccer all over the state of Georgia at all levels. Last night, we were in Clarkston for our SDH Games of the Week. And in the girls' match, Holy Innocence, dominant performance, 10-0 at halftime. That finished that one. Uh, It looked like it might go a little differently after it got to about 3-0. Clarkston kind of settled in, played pretty well for a while, and they lost their top player, their sweeper, due to injury. looked like an ankle And after that, it all kind of fell apart defensively. Uh, Great performance from Holy Innocence, and that's a team to watch. And you'll hear more about Holy Innocence as we go today. But let's talk about the boys' game a little bit last night, the one that I called. Uh, John Nelson had the girls' game. The Angoras of Clarkston had the better overall record, but Holy Innocence with a really strong region record. And when you learn a little bit about their story, missing goalkeeper Preston Kate for the majority of the season with a lacerated kidney. This was his third game of the year last night. And man, he made such a difference for his team. Big play late where he comes out, he knows he's going to get hit, gets to the ball first. Don't think he took a direct kick to the body. I think uh, it was hitting the ball and it into his body. Heavy collision. Both players were a little shaken up by it. But Kate's leadership and his ability in goal made a couple of big saves. Really good footwork from him. And for somebody who hasn't played a lot this season, really impressive. He gets the clean sheet for Holy Innocence. Leads them to a 1-0 win. They didn't get forward a ton in this one. But the goal, it comes off of a great sequence. Uh, Right back, Alex Weir put in a very dangerous cross that was between the Clarkston goalkeeper and back line trying to, to knock it clear, accidentally gets knocked into the goal, and that does it. That decides it. Holy Innocence with a very strong defensive performance. And again, you look at the overall records and you're like, wow, that's a huge upset. But when you look at the region records and you look at recent performance, it was a very evenly matched game coming in, and it was a very evenly matched game in the 80 minutes. A really fun game to call. One of the better games we've had this season on our SDH Game of the Week. Uh, great time over at Hallford Stadium in Clarkston. Two teams to keep an eye on, both of them. If Clarkston can get the attacking half and really the attacking third sorted out, I think they're a dangerous team. Some incredible talent with that team. And Holy Innocence... Look, it's almost like a new season with their goalkeeper back in play. They didn't really have a backup goalkeeper. So it was kind of a a rotation of field players in goal. And they struggled, and they gave up a lot of goals. But now it's almost like a new season for them. This is going to be a team to pay attention to as well in 4A. We'll get into 4A here in a minute. But as we do on Soccer is in Session, we get caught up on the latest state rankings And there's some little bits of news along the way, too. We're not going to dig as deep into result by result with each team this week. But where the state rankings are, the best teams that are on the outside looking in, and some notes about each classification. Let's start with 7A girls, top 10 in scoreboard.com. That's the coaches poll updated on Sunday. Buford at 11-2, number one. Mill Creek, Walton, Archer, Norcross, Forsyth Central, Denmark, North Paulding back into the top 10, Campbell, and Hillgrove. That's your top 10. Best five on the outside looking in Richmond Hill at 11 and 0. Brookwood fell out of the top 10 this week. They're 10 and 3. Harrison Hoyas, Parkview, and Meadow Creek. But Meadow Creek was upset last night in a home loss to South Forsyth. Now, the storylines in 7A revolve around one and two. Buford went into their match last night, ranked number one. Mill Creek was the host. They were number two, and it was the number two Hawks who got the win. Needed overtime to do it. Three, two winners. Karina Pashkovitz 
was named the player of the game. That win puts Mill Creek in the driver's seat to win the region, and it should put them in the driver's seat to be the number one team in the state next week. Now, there will be more games the rest of the week, but Mill Creek beating number one Buford, huge, huge performance for the Hawks. Also last night, number nine, Campbell. They went on the road and beat number five, Norcross, also in overtime, 3-2. Big Region 3 win for Harrison. They're on the outside looking in at the top ten, but they won at home versus number eight, North Paulding, last night. That was a 1-0 win. The Hoyas lead the region at 4-1 and one in region play. North Paulding and Hillgrove are both 4-2. and two. Harrison played the bottom two teams in the region the next two games, so they should go to 6-1. and one. Again, upsets do happen. But then Harrison will go to Hillgrove to finish region play on March 31st. And, you know, look, you, you might say, ah, well, they're all going to go to the state tournament. But there's a huge difference between finishing first, second, third, and fourth. Top four in each region go. And it, it creates some log jams – and it creates some really difficult matchups earlier in the bracket than you want. Now, look, if somebody is a surprise that maybe underperforms a little bit in the regular season and falls into that four spot, things can happen. Look, the brackets can be a little unpredictable. But you'd love to get that number one spot going in to the state tournament out of your region. It should give you a better pathway. Harrison, even though they're not a top ten team, might just do that with their performance in that big win over North Paulding last night. Let's move over to 7A, boys. We have a new number one. It's the Lambert Longhorns, 11-1-1. and Hillgrove, number two. South Forsyth, three. Collins Hill, who was number one for most of the season, they fall to four. Now they're 13-2 and two overall. Walton is five. Mill Creek is six. Peachtree Ridge, seven. Mountain View, eight. Osborne gets into the top 10 at 9, and Brookwood ranked number 10. Best five win percentages of unranked teams, Richmond Hill on the boys' side, 10-2-1. Colquitt County, the Packers are 7-1-2. Denmark, 7-2-1. They fell out of the top 10 this week. Pebblebrook, 7-2-1. And, and Burkmar at 10-4-1. Storylines in 7A boys, South Forsyth, they needed overtime and penalties to get past Meadow Creek last night to go to 12-1 and overall. Mill Creek, what a year for the Hawks at 11-2. and They are sixth in 7A. They won 5-2 last night. The girls won in, in overtime. The boys did not need overtime. It was a 5-1 win over Buford. Mill Creek, 6-0 and in region play, alone in first. Most wins in a season since 2017. They have clinched a state playoff appearance now, their first since 2018. Tiebreakers cost them a spot the last two years, and they were determined to not have it come down to that. They've already clinched their spot, and they might be the number one team in Region 8 in 7A. Keep an eye on Mill Creek on the boys' side as well as the girls' side. Other storylines in 7A boys, Peachtree Ridge. They're currently second in the region. They're behind Norcross. Norcross has the inside track to winning the region title. Norcross on the boys' side, overall record, not strong, but they might be number one in the region, which would then push Peachtree Ridge down into a number two spot in the region, which creates some interesting matchups as you go in the tournament. Just keep an eye on these things. We'll try to give you a better glimpse of this next week on the show as we get into those final region games around the state. Denmark, I mentioned they were knocked out of the top 10 this week. They're currently fourth in the region. 7-2-1 and one overall, but those two losses are region losses. If they finish fourth in the region, now they, they still have time to climb higher, but if they finish fourth, that would potentially put them on a collision course in round one in the playoffs with number five, Walton. It's not a game Denmark wants. It's not a game Walton wants either if Denmark is a surprising fourth spot in the region. We'll try to break some of this down and, and kind of lay out the brackets as they look next week on Soccer is in Session. 
6A girls, new number one. It's the Marist War Eagles at 9-0-2. Lassiter is second. Blessed Trinity third. Pope fourth. Roswell fifth. St. Pius sixth. North Atlanta seventh. Alatoona eighth. Jackson County nine. And Alexander at ten. Best five of the teams that are unranked, the Mundy's Mill Tigers, 10-1 and one on the year. Habersham Central, 11-2. Glenn Academy, 11-2-1. Noonan, the Cougars nine three and one, and Thomas County Central eight and three. Last night, Habersham Central unranked went on the road. They won three two at number nine Jackson County. We'll see if maybe that flips next week if Habersham Central gets into the top ten. Jackson County falls out. Lassiter nine one and two now on the girls side. They were held to a scoreless draw last night at home by Kennesaw Mountain. Also, on the teams that are unranked, Mundy's Mill, uh, we, we've talked to the Tigers and talked about the Tigers a good bit. Leslie Ortega, one of the leading scorers in the state in any classification, she has 27 goals this year for Mundy's Mill. 6A boys, also a new number one. This is after last week's chaos of the top three teams losing last Tuesday. All the way up from number four, it is Lanier, the Longhorns, 13-0-1. Rest of the top ten, Lassiter at two, Riverwood at three, Sprayberry at four, Blessed Trinity at five, Gainesville at six, Johns Creek at seven, River Ridge at eight, Veterans at nine, and St. Pius at ten. Best five on the outside looking in, Glenn Academy, perfect 13-0. South Effingham, they were knocked out of the top 10 this week. They're 10 2 and 1. Lovejoy 7 and 2, Forest Park 9 2 and 2, and Rome at 7 2 and 1. Storylines mentioned Lanier moving all the way up to number 1. They have not lost this year. There's only one other team in the top 10 that can say that Veterans at 15 and 0, ranked number 9. You want to get into difficulty of schedule, that's going to keep veterans lower in the top 10. But Lanier, unbeaten, they jumped to one. Riverwood bounced back. They clinched a region title championship with a win versus South Cobb last night. Gainesville, a little bit of a surprise, a 2-2 draw last night at Flowery Branch. That's a rivalry matchup for the Red Elephants. South Effingham knocked out of the top 10 this week and also got to give a shout-out to North Forsyth. They have now clinched their first ever GHSA State Tournament appearance. Congrats to North Forsyth on the boys' side in 6A. 5A girls. Shambly continues as number one. Rest of the top 10, Midtown. Loganville at three. McIntosh at four. Cambridge, five. Harris County, six. Jefferson 7, Northside Columbus 8, Greater Atlanta Christian 9, and the Northview Titans get into the top 10 at 10. Best 5 on the outside looking in, Greenbrier, the Wolfpack are a perfect 13-0-0, Dutchtown 11-1, Ware County 11-2-1, Arabia Mountain 9-2, and and Chapel Hill 8-2. A couple of storylines in 5A girls. McIntosh were held to a 2-2 draw last night at Pace Academy. Surprising result there for the Chiefs. The Patriots of Northside Columbus, they have one of the leading scorers in 5A, Isabella Frelaney at 29 goals on the year. But there's somebody who's a few goals ahead, and it's Savannah Calloway of the Dutchtown Bulldogs with 35 goals in 2023. 5A boys, let's get caught up on the top 10. McIntosh, number one. However, there is a news update. We will talk about it after we get through the rest of the top 10. Dalton at two, Clark Central at three, Chapel Hill four, Greenbrier five, Tucker six, Midtown at seven, Villa Rica eight, Cambridge nine, and Kell at 10. Top five win percentages of unranked teams, Locust Grove at 9-2, and two, the Charles Drew Titans 6-1-1, and one, Union Grove 9-3-2, and two, Bradwell Institute 7-3-2, and, and Dutchtown at 7-4-1. and one. The big news in 5A boys is McIntosh. The girls weren't the only Chiefs side. 
that was held to a draw last night at Pace Academy. The boys were as well. They were 14-0-0 coming into the match, number one in the state in all classifications, according to scoreboard.com and according to Max Preps. But now they have a blemish on that record. It's not a big one, but it is a blemish. 14-0-1 now for the Chiefs after a 1-1 draw. Dalton won last night 5-4. That was against the Baylor School from Tennessee. Greenbrier, just as a reminder, 12-2 overall. You'll see a 14-0-0 record in some places, but their first two games were forfeited due to a breach of GHSA rules about community coaches and involvement at the same youth clubs as players in the program that took their first two wins off the board. Blake Bias has scored 20 goals for the Wolfpack. Definitely a player to watch. And Kel, the Longhorns, they fell to 9-6 and six last night overall. They played a very difficult schedule. They lost 3-0 on the road at Northview on Tuesday. 4A girls, top 10, number 1, North Oconee stays in the top spot, 11-0-2 overall. Rest of the top 10. Holy Innocence at 10-1-1 now after their win over Clarkston. They're two. Cherokee Bluffs, three. Westminster, four. Perry, five. Perfect 15-0-0. Southeast Whitfield at six. Northwest Whitfield at seven. Stars Mill at eight. Heritage Ringgold at nine. Whitewater at ten. Best five win percentages of the unranked teams. Southeast Bullock at 12-1. Madison County, 10-3. Bainbridge, the Bearcats are 11-3-1. Mount Zion of Jonesboro, 9-3. And, and the Johnson Knights at 8-3-1. A couple of storylines in 4A girls. Southeast Whitfield, they lost last night to Sonoraville, 1-0. That's after a loss to Northwest Whitfield last week. The Raiders at 8-2-2. They've had a great year, but kind of hitting a, a skid here. We'll see if they can bounce back. Uh, Zoe St. John for Heritage Ringgold, one of the leading scorers in the state with 30 goals. Uh, right behind her for Bainbridge, Addison Hill, she has 28 goals on the year. Let's move over to 4A boys. Johnson of Gainesville stays at number one, perfect 13-0-0. Rest of the top ten, Westminster at two, Southeast Whitfield at three, Perry at four, East Hall is five, Islands is six, Chestity at seven, Lovett is eight, North Oconee number nine, and Whitewater at number ten. Best five win percentages of unranked teams, Shaw, the Raiders are 11-1, and one. Stockbridge, 9-1, and one. Bainbridge, 12-1-2, Spalding, the Jaguars are 10-3, and, and the Cairo Syrup Makers, 8-2-2 two two on the year. Couple of storylines here in 4A boys. Love it. Nick Carano, he recently became Love It's all time leading scorer. We talked about that last week. He's got 21 goals this season, one of the leading scorers on the boys' side in the state. Jackson Morgan of Whitewater also has 21 goals this season. One behind them, Andres Bonilla of Shaw with 20. But keep an eye as well on Gerson Tiznado, 15 assists this season for Shaw. Bainbridge also has one of the top scorers, Brock Williams at 24 goals in 2023. Jose Bonilla-Ortiz has 16 assists for the Bearcats. Now, we're going to zero in on one of the regions here in 4A boys, and man, is it going to be tricky as you get down to the wire. It's region 8 in 4A. So last night, number 7, Chestity. They scored three first-half goals. They held on in the second half to beat North Oconee 3-2. North Oconee scored two. They got one with, I think, about eight, nine minutes left. Pushed for the winner, pushed for the equalizer. They couldn't get it. So that was critical for Chestity. Here's why. The other games in the region, East Hall at number five, they moved into second all alone. They won 3-0 over Cherokee Bluff on the road. So the region standings as we speak, and Jonathan Torres had a hat trick in that 3-0 win for East Hall. Johnson is a perfect 7-0 in Region 8. 
there are ten, there are eleven teams in the region, so ten games in the region schedules. There are still games to be played. Johnson at seven and zero, oh, East Hall at seven and one, North Oconee at six and two now after the loss to Chestity. They're seven and three. Their region schedule is done. It's locked in at seven and three. In a lot of regions, that's going to get you in. Six and four might not have got them in. Seven and three should. So then you start to look at North Oconee, East Hall a little bit with what they have left with two games left because Cherokee Bluff is four and three. East Forsyth is five and four. They can get to six and four. Second year at three and four, it's probably too much to ask for them to be perfect to close it out to get to six and four. Cedar Shoals one and five, Walnut Grove zero oh and six, North Hall zero oh and seven, Madison County zero oh and six. So that win for Chesity to get them to seven and three doesn't guarantee anything yet, but it's vital for them to lock that in. North Oconee and East Hall, you have to keep an eye on them because Cherokee Bluff and East Forsyth are both still in the mix in Region Eight in Four A. That one's going to go down to the wire. All right, 3A girls, top 10. Oconee County remains number one. Lumpkin County, two. Wesleyan, three. Hebron Christian Academy, four. Morgan County, five. Dawson County, six. Bremen, seven. White County, eight. Cahulla Creek, nine. And Pike County ranked number 10. Best five win percentages of the unranked. Savannah Country Day, perfect 8-0 and o for the Hornets. Calvary Day, 8-2-2, two, and two. Long County, 9-3, and three. Harlem Bulldogs, 10-3-1, and one. and the Thomasville Bulldogs, 8-3-1. and one. Last night, number one, Oconee County, they displayed their dominance. 10-0 win at home against number four, Hebron Christian Academy. That's the first loss for the Lions this year, 10-0. Morgan County, first blemish on their record came last night, a 2-2 draw versus Eastside. Wesleyan got ranked number three this week in 3A. They lost last night to Decatur 3-0. See if the Wolves remain ranked even at 5-5-3. and three. Again, very difficult non-region schedule for Wesleyan, but Morgan County, even with the draw, they should be higher. I think Dawson County, they haven't lost yet. Savannah Country Day not even being in the top 10 at perfect 8 No, We'll see what the 3A rankings look like on the girls' side next week. 3A boys, Columbus remains number one at 12-1 and one overall. Two is Cahulla Creek. Three is Oconee County. Four is Bremen. Five is Hebron Christian Academy. Six, Savannah Christian. Seven, Savannah Country Day. 8, Wesleyan, 9, Pike County, and 10, the Jackson Red Devils. Top 5 on the outside looking in, Harlem at 10-3, and three, Franklin County 9-3-1, and one, Long County also 9-3-1, and one, Morgan County 6-2-2, two and, two, and Crisp County, the Cougars, are 7-3. and three. Couple of notes in 3A boys, Saul Barsenas of Cahulla Creek, 20 goals this season, one of leave six players on the boys' side to score more than 20 goals so far in 2023. Wesleyan, girls were upset last night by Decatur. The boys were also upset last night 2-1 by Decatur. That was at Wesleyan. Jackson also upset last night, ranked or ranked in the top 10 for the first time in a while. They lost 2-1 to Mary Persons last night at home. Harlem, the Bulldogs, outside looking in. They've been ranked so far this season at different points. Carson Glidewell, second leading scorer in the state on the boys' side with 27 goals, according to Max Preps. He's also second in the state in assists with 16. Justin Green, his teammate, leads the state in assists with 18. That's what's being tracked by Max Preps so far in the stats that have been inputted there. 2A girls. No real changes on the top 10. Nothing major. Fitzgerald, the Purple Hurricane, stay number one at 14, 1-1. One one. Model, perfect 12-0, number two. Fellowship Christian, perfect 11-0-0, ranked number three. Callaway's four. Athens Academy, five. Putnam County, six. Savannah Arts Academy, seven. Mount Perrin Christian, eight. Landmark Christian, nine. Worth County, number 10. 
best five win percentages of unranked teams, the Elite Scholars Academy of Jonesboro, the Royal Knights are 5-0-0. They probably will win their region, although that's not a guarantee. Team to watch. Not really playing many games this year, not really tested, but let's see where the Elite Scholars Academy ends up. Pierce County 11 and 2, North Cobb Christian 10 and 2, the Rutland Hurricanes are 5 and 2 and the Drew Charter Eagles are 7 and 3. Let's move over to the boys side in 2A. Also not a ton of changes, but there is a new number 1. It's Landmark Christian 10 and 2 now on the year for the War Eagles. Number 2 Providence Christian, number 3 Fitzgerald, 4 Putnam County, 5 Savannah Arts Academy, 6 Model, 7 Union County. 8, North Murray, 9, Tattnall County, 10, Toombs County, and the best five win percentages of the unranked. Drew Charter, 9-0-1, Spencer, the Green Wave, are 8-1, Westside, 6-1, Towers, 7-1-1, and Pierce County at 10-3. and Let's move down to 1A D2 Girls, Aquinas, perfect 8-0, ranked number 1, McIntosh County Academy, number two. Lincoln County, three. Lake Oconee Academy, four. Hawkinsville at five. Johnson County at six. Atlanta Classical Academy at seven. Portal is eight. Atkinson County, nine. And Towns County at ten. Couple outsiders. Not a lot of teams over 500 in 1A D2 girls. Dooley County at six and six. Mount Zion of Carrollton at five and six couple of, of notes, Maddie McMahon of McIntosh County Academy, one of the leading scorers in the state on the girls' side, 31 goals for McMahon. And one update on the score side from last night, Lake Oconee Academy, number four, they went on the road and won at number three, Lincoln County, 2-0. 1AD2 boys, new number one, it's the GMC Bulldogs, 9-1-1 one one on the year. They're ranked ahead of number two, Christian Heritage. Three is Lake Oconee Academy. Four, Atkinson County. Five, Portal. Six, Chattahoochee County. Seven, Dooley County. Eight, Aquinas. Nine, Hawkinsville. And ten, Eccles County. Mount Zion of Carrollton, just above the 500 mark at five and four. They are unranked. Couple of notes here. Jose Sanchez, 28 goals for Portal. That's the most in the state on the boys' side, according to Max Preps. Eccles County, Region 1 in 1AD2, not playing a, a traditional region schedule. Their tournament started yesterday. The Wildcats of Eccles County, a 3 2 win over Macon County. They have a tough one coming up on Friday. They are facing number six, Chattahoochee County. 1A D1 Girls Commerce continues as your number one team, 12 and 1 on the year. Ivy Tolbert leading the state. Boys and girls, 51 goals so far in 2023 for Ivy Tolbert. Number two, East Lawrence, three, Bleckley County, four, Pidea, five, Scriven County, six, Dade County, seven, Whitfield Academy, eight, Social Circle. 9 Tallulah Falls, and 10 Lamar County. Best five winning percentages on the outside looking in. Galloway, only four games this year, but they've won three of them, the Scots. Darlington Tigers, 7 and 4. Crawford County, 5 and 3. Prince Avenue Christian up to 8 and 5. And Temple, the Tigers are 6, 4, and 1. I mentioned Ivy Tolbert, 51 goals, the number two goal scorer in the state boys or girls, also from 1AD1 girls, Peyton Brooks of Social Circle. Commerce and Social Circle met in the state championship game last year. I don't know. Maybe that happens again this year. And last year, that was one of the best games that I called anywhere, anything. Kind of hoping we might get a rematch of that. That one went to overtime, and it was wild. Wouldn't mind seeing it again. Scriven County at number five last night. They had a loss. They're down to 11-2 and two now overall. It was the 3A Harlem. It was a 3-2 loss for the Gamecocks of Scriven County. Let's finish it out with 1A D1 boys. Paideia remains number one. They haven't lost 8-0-5 oh, on the year. Tallulah Falls hasn't lost either. No draws for the Indians. They're 12-0-0. Oh, 
Atlanta International at number three. Bacon County is four. Bleckley County, five. Whitfield Academy, six. Woodville Tompkins Institute, seven. Dalton Academy, eight. Elbert County, nine. And Tryon, the Bulldogs are number 10. Best five on the outside looking in, according to win percentage overall. Jefferson County at eight, two, and two. Coosa at five, two, and one. The Barrow Arts and Sciences Academy at seven and four. Metter at six and four, and Darlington also at six and four. Couple of notes here in one A D one boys. Charlie Williams third in the state on the boys side with twenty six goals, according to Max Preps. Plays for Bleckley County with their eleven and four record. And Woodville Tompkins seven and four overall. They lost last night on the road at Claxton one nil. If you're looking for detailed coverage of the Dalton area, make sure you're following Monday Night Football on Facebook. Their show airs on WDNN. They're also on Instagram now. That's definitely a follow over on the IG. New episodes every Monday night during the high school season on YouTube. Go search for WDNN. It airs at 8 o'clock. You can also watch it on demand. A couple of shout-outs as well. Make sure you are following Blitz Sports GA. That's on Twitter, blitzsportsga.com. All the latest in high school soccer, but also other high school sports from Northeast Georgia. Great outlet there, Blitz Sports GA. Big shout out to the Gwinnett Daily Post as well and WDUN in the Hall County area for just consistently good coverage of local high school soccer. Always telling the stories about these teams and these programs and what's going on and some of the great players that are playing in Georgia high school soccer. Thank you to WDUN and to the Gwinnett Daily Post. I've got a list of active Georgia high school soccer accounts on Twitter. You can follow that. If I'm missing your school, please let me know. Follow me. I'll get you added to that list. Follow me on Instagram as well. It's a long shoe in either place. And I will follow you back, and it will help me as I try to tell the story of Georgia high school soccer in 2023 and beyond. If you've got news, let me know. Follow me anywhere on social media at Longshoe. Coming up next on the show, Clayton Schmidt of the number two ranked Holy Innocence Golden Bears. He joined John Nelson earlier today for an interview. The Golden Bears, big win over Clarkston last night on the girls' side. Check that interview out right after this. Why are interscholastic sports called the last classroom of the day? Because they teach students important life lessons like teamwork, accountability, and perseverance. School sports are so much more than a game. They're about developing the whole person. That's why they're an essential part of every student's education. Encourage your student to participate in the last classroom of the day. Interscholastic sports in Georgia. This message presented by the GHSA and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Welcome back to Soccer's In Session, and it's time for our in-session interview for the week, and we get to catch up with our friends at Holy Innocence and the head girls coach, Clayton Schmidt. Coach, thanks for hanging out with us and going in session. Yeah, thanks for having us, and definitely appreciate the coverage and support for the game last night. Glad you guys were able to see uh, some, hopefully, some enjoyable matches between both teams. Yep, dominant effort by Holy Innocence on uh, the, the boys' and the girls' side. Reason that uh, we've got you here is to talk about a team that only has one loss and one draw in your 12 matches so far this year. Out of the blocks right now, you're number two in Region 6 Quad A at 10-1-1. and one. Let me go to the, the loss to Fellowship about a month ago. What did you learn about yourselves as a side in a 4-1 loss that you've been able to carry with you from that game forward? Yeah, I think it's it's good in any season to be able to look at, you know, any, any results that go maybe different ways than you expected and then be able to kind of assess what you did well and uh, what you need to improve upon. Um, as a preface to all of this, we're in a little bit of a unique situation in that uh, we have – several players that contribute both at the varsity basketball and varsity soccer level 
so for us we kind of you know are fortunate enough that the uh the seasons don't completely overlap and by the time our trolls around we're able to add uh for example one of our captains olivia hutcherson um who's committed to play basketball at princeton next year and come in as one of our been one of our best attacking threats the past several years uh plays up top and is quite a handful to deal with and then this year that was also um Lauren Malsom, who's a dynamic attacking player uh, that's been called into the national pool at the younger ages and, um, you know, is, is incredibly skilled and we're, we're fortunate to be able to, to add them. So um, regardless of what, you know, the first half of the season goes, it's an opportunity for us to, you know, assess kind of how everything else is going on and as well as where they might fit in upon return. So from that perspective, you know, we're, we're constantly evaluating, judging, uh, and figuring out like what the best system is. And um, in this case, I think we've kind of settled on on some things there. But um, I think the big takeaway from that game was in particular, you know, um, you can think in your head, okay, like a slight tweak or change the system for us kind of between 3-4-3 three, three and 4-3-3. Three, three, uh, and that came in specific. You know, um, I, I think we kind of struggled with a couple of key moments there. And um out, like basically within the last five minutes of the first half and the first you know five or so minutes of the second half you know kind of made some critical errors uh that led to them scoring you know through the three goals that were the the margin of difference in the game but um you know at the same time like in a bigger picture perpetual development view uh it gives us a chance to get everyone else up to speed as well as you know find kind of the proverbial next man up for, um, you know, when we're down in the trenches or so later in the season in the playoffs and we want to be able to assess, okay, you know, um, we're maybe in a stalemate and then we need to change a pace or a spark off the bench. What what can we change and and who's kind of ready for those moments? So, um, you know, when lose or draw in these kind of early season games, it's just an invaluable experience for everybody. And, um, you know, our goal is to both be, competitive and successful as well as making sure that we're not uh you know ignoring the development opportunities we have each and every time that you know uh the ball gets kicked in that first 80 minute or the first part of the 80 minutes is ready to uh to commence when it comes to scheduling i I guess from a a non-region perspective with what you and your staff have been able to accomplish there at holy innocence since your tenure started you're over triple digits and wins and uh, heading to the last game of the year, expecting to win championships and, and, and all of that. How difficult is it for you to schedule non-region opponents so you can get through that first season, get into season two, meaning region play, knowing that you want to finish your third season, that postseason, winning a championship? How difficult is it to schedule knowing the pedigree that you've established? Yeah, it, it is incredibly difficult. And, uh, you know, we're – probably one of the few schools out there that uh, does not have a a lit stadium field. So for us, it's even more uh, of a little bit of, uh, you know, juggling to figure out how to do that. But the other part is bearing in mind that, you know, whenever you try to schedule, you want to make sure that it's, it's a game that's fairly well balanced for your boys and your girls programs uh, and be able to, you know, kind of keep the same say local rivals involved as long as it's not too lopsided one way or the other, but at the same time, you know, find good games that are going to be able to provide those opportunities, like I mentioned, for, you know, newer players maybe moving up for JV or in our case, as a, as, you know, at the high school level, if players are coming in from different schools uh, and see where they fit in. So um, there's no real, you know, right or wrong way to do it. Um, I think that, you know, having been in the, the high school level uh, and since 2015 at Holy Innocence um, for a fair amount of time, we've gotten a good handle on what makes the sense the most sense in terms of uh, balancing, you know, competitive matches for both teams, you know, not putting them out in terms of distance um, where, you know, a, a boys game kicking off at eight, they're getting home, you know, close to 11, try to, to avoid that on the road early on. But, um, you know, the main thing is we just want good competitive matches all the way around. And part of it is it's also with, uh, you know, here in our lovely state of Georgia, all the weather that we have to deal with constantly, um, we're spoiled with uh, a beautiful grass field, but same time, you know, that early part of the season tends to be maybe a little bit rainier and uh, we want to make sure that we get as many of those games in as we can. 
but um, you know, I think this year we played some different teams and we were able to, you know, um, get kind of an early look at what some of the better four A opponents were in terms of, um, you know, how they did at their different respective levels last year, including Cherokee Bluff um, had a really tight game with them. We were able to uh, to score a late goal in the second half to win, kind of hold on, um, you know, and for the boys, it's kind of figuring out where they fall relative to the rest of the four A transition. Where uh, I think there's tremendous depth in the in the four A level on the boys' side, in particular, you know, with the, the schools from the Dalton area and around the metro area, the South Side. There's you know, there's like our region, including you know, the schools like Clarkson and Westminster. You know, uh, that there's a, a maybe a wider breadth of um, you know a teams that you could consider to be challenging for. Uh, the state championship. So, uh, but I think that, you know, that's, that's a good problem to have. We get to play some different opponents this year and have uh, enjoyed that challenge so far in terms of, you know, maybe going out a little bit more of our, our comfort zone, whereas the, you know, you kind of get locked into the previously for us, the one, a private mindset of let's play, you know, a lot of the private schools and they're all loaded with club players, et cetera. You know, that's good and that's fun, but um, for us to be able to do some things that we're, you know, testing ourselves and, uh, and you know, and, and getting on on the road early on, I think, is uh, a good way to test your metal and, like I said, be perpetually moving towards the goal of you know finishing playing your uh, your best soccer at the end of the season. And having to do that with that bullseye on your chest because of what you've established, everybody's going to come at you. I would imagine both non-region and region as you've now jumped into Quad A, they're going to come at you with their best because for a lot of teams. It might be their championship game, knowing how stacked Quad A is this year and next because of reclassification. What's it like for you and the staff to to try to manage this, knowing that you are you are being gunned after by pretty much every team that you're going to face? Yeah, it's it's a huge test, and also for our players, it's an opportunity that uh, that they can either take and make the most of and shine or excel, or uh, you know, use it as a moment for us to reflect and see where, you know, we maybe broke down or need to uh, revisit some specifics in terms of our style of play. But, um, you know, it, you, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of saying it, it's a really competitive atmosphere. And, um, you know, that that forces us, I think, uh, in terms of like iron sharpening iron or so to speak, you know, making sure that even at our, our worst, if we can, you know, be successful and get results early on, especially on the road against, like you said, teams that are gunning for you, uh, then I think that is only going to move us, you know, uh, further in the direction we want to go by the end of the season. But, you know, it, it's uh, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that, uh, like you said, everyone kind of wants, wants a piece of you and making sure that, uh, you know, you reinforce that. And for us, that, that message gets driven home in training and uh, and making sure that every time we step on the field that we're, we're representing the school and ourselves with, uh, the most intensity and um, best possible decision making that we can, because, like you said, you know, when you have a pedigree of success, it's it's easy for people to to want to knock you off of that pedestal. Clayton Schmidt, the girls' head coach at Holy Innocence, hanging out with us for another couple of minutes here for our in session interview this week on Soccer's in session, brought to us by our friends at Kaiser Permanente. When you when you look at Quad A, you mentioned what's going on there and. It's been a special group of seniors that have been on this ride with you, chasing after championships, getting championships, Final Fours, and that kind of stuff. When I mention the senior class that is there with you this year, what sticks in your mind about that group of individuals that have helped you and helped add to the the trophy cases and to the reputation of Holy Innocent? Yeah, I think we're blessed with three very different and uh, talented and, you know, roles, uh, of our three seniors and and captains. Um, and you know, the, the start of their soccer experience was obviously kind of a strange one in terms of, you know, blowing through the first part of the 2020 spring season and then literally playing our first region game and then not playing again for almost, you know, full 10 more months. So, uh, I think that, you know, that kind of set in their minds that, you don't take any of these opportunities for granted, um, you know, and that having experienced success and, you know, the, call it like the, the ultimate um, the failure, but, you know, feeling of, uh, 
frustration when you know you're right there you're a game away from winning the state championship last year i think has only helped shape them to become um better stewards of the program and the standards we try to set as well as you know providing um us with a kind of voice as well to echo sentiment of hey there's something for granted and you know um each and every time you set foot on this field you don't know what's going to happen and we need to make the most of these opportunities and not taking anything or anyone lightly um you know specifically for us it's and also three very different players that have all played both the high level club and other sports um you know and they all add very different um strengths and you know um unique personalities the team you know for us and that helps uh us in terms of like uh, the collective um uh, you know persona of the team being able to be um a lot tighter knit and uh along the same lines in terms of mentality and playing style when you, know, you have players from you know once uh reese has excelled at you know um track and cross country level and done well there olivia obviously is going to play um, division one college basketball next year, you know, and then Maria has been um, an elite sprinter as well as, you know, um, an excellent soccer player going to play, you know, at one of the top 10 division three programs next year. So um, adding that into, you know, what I would also say is a, a really good, strong junior class as well um, has only made sure. And like you said, uh, helped establish the standards and reinforce those, you know, um, We'll say like, uh, I guess, staples or hallmarks of our program throughout the time that, um, you know, that I've been there and for us to be able to have them perpetually um, not grooming per se, but, you know, ensuring that the standards are met by the younger players and that they understand, hey, this is serious, you know, like we're here to have fun, but we're going to compete at the highest level each and every year, you know, and that if you're lucky enough to be given that opportunity, make sure you make the most of it. And you've got a real challenging run in here in region. Four matches within the span of eight or nine days, depending on how you count your calendar. You've got Druid Hills on Thursday. Then we'll then go from then you go from Thursday to Friday. Thursday, Druid Hills. Next Tuesday against Stone Mountain at Stone Mountain. You've got Southwest Cab a week from Thursday. Then the following day, according to the schedule makers, it is a match against Stevenson. Because, I mean, it, this is going to be a challenge for, for your side. 3-0 and right now in region. Right now you're second. But those four matches in eight or nine days going to be a real challenge for you for the run. And what, what are your uh, anticipations for those four matches coming up? Yeah, I think that, uh, you yeah, know, the immediate task at hand in terms of playing Druid Hills is going to be our most difficult um, region match to date. And I think that for us, the, the key is going to be to continue off the momentum from the early part of this as well as the the first half of our season, we'll say, uh, and make sure that, you know, kind of protect the, the den or as we would say. So, uh, home of the golden bears, but, um, so I think that's the first step. And then, you know, um, not looking too far ahead, but in terms of being able to get everything in, in terms of, you know, fixture congestion, knowing that because of our depth and, um, level of experience from top to bottom, that, you know, it's going to give a lot of our other players opportunities to to get minutes to shine and, and compete at the high school varsity level. And again, kind of help us further delineate um, who's ready to make an impact for for a playoff run and uh, hopefully deep into the playoffs. But, you know, we're really excited for, for this opportunity from a physiological standpoint. We're, we're very blessed that um, you should have myself. We have great resources at the school and uh, with our assistant coaches. Um, Jose Casique does an excellent job in terms of managing load. And, um, you know, over the time that uh, three years that he's been with us, um, we've had, you know, uh, a number of injuries on, that you can count on one hand in terms of, uh, you know, we'll say preventative type injuries with that would be sprains or strains and things like that, you know. Um, but so the the plan that we put in place is um, is one that, you know, that the girls are have bought into and it's led to us being, uh, you know, as the old adage would say, the, the best avail the best ability is availability and um, being able to count on as many players as possible through the, the home stretch of the season as a result of, you know, the, the work that you're putting in in practice and not overtraining, but also staying sharp and uh, monitoring your, your load management throughout the season, especially when, like you said, you know, four matches in uh, a quick 
succession. So it's, it's hard for anybody, but I think that um, we're as well suited as anybody to, uh, to overcome the challenge there. And we'll keep an eye on things as you go in quad A. Clayton Schmidt, head coach of Holy Innocence. Right now, 10-1-1, 3-0 in Region 6 Quad A. Coach, thanks for hanging out with us and being our in-session interview this week, pulling back the curtain what's going on there with Holy Innocence with a real challenging run in. We'll keep an eye on things in Quad A. Thanks for hanging out with us here on SDH. Yep, thanks for having us, and look forward to seeing you guys at your next game. Soccer's in session, presented by Kaiser Permanente, continues with Jason as he tours the state. More after this. Attention high school sports fans, are you an armchair official? You know, the parent or fan who constantly yells at the referees and loves to let everyone know just how bad you think they are. Well, if you think you could do better, then get in the game and prove it. It's time for you to suit up and make the calls where they actually count. Every sport in Georgia needs more officials. Sign up today at highschoolofficials.com. Welcome back to Soccer is in Session, presented by Kaiser Permanente here on the SDH Network. I'm Jason Longshore. Thanks again to Clayton Schmidt of Holy Innocence for joining us this week for our in-session interview, and good luck to the Golden Bears the rest of the way on the girls' side with Clayton Schmidt's squad. Really good performance last night in their win over Clarkston. Let's get caught up on a few of the commitments and some college updates as well. Celine Flores of Jeff Davis High School, she's committed to Gordon State, and her high school teammate Peyton Thigpen will play at Georgia Military College in the fall. Jacob Grimmer of Alexander High School has committed to Reinhardt University. Tanner Beam of Eastside High School in Covington announced his commitment to Piedmont University. Life University, they announced the signing of defender Vuk Kristic from Serbia. He'll join them in the fall. A couple of other players joining in the fall. Let's go to Georgia State. Hidetu Gondo, a defender from Fukuoka, Japan. He will join the Panthers in the fall. They'll also be adding a local talent, Carter Dixon, from St. Pius and from Concord Fire, another defender joining Brett Serenci's Panthers. Georgia Southern announced a commitment yesterday from Denmark. Noah Cargo will be joining the Eagles in the fall. Georgia State on the women's side, ID camp this Saturday. There's still just a couple of spots remaining if you're interested. Get more information at JoyceSoccerSchool.com. And you're going to hear from Georgia State women's soccer coach Ed Joyce. As we get past the high school season and we start to look a- ahead a little bit to the fall and the college season, Ed, somebody I've gotten to know uh, in the college side of things, calling games for Georgia State, and I, I think he has a really interesting uh, approach to building the Panthers roster and-, and the program and the style of play. So really excited to pick Ed Joyce's brain. And if you are looking for an ID camp and – You have an opening for Saturday. If you're a female player wanting to get noticed by the Georgia State program, go to JoyceSoccerSchool.com and check out the information to get one of those last couple of spots for the camp on Saturday. Upcoming games of importance. There are a few that I wanted to highlight before we go. Big game next Tuesday at Walton as the Raiders host St. Pius. One of those cross-classification games, really one of the last cross-classification games as the season is coming down to an end. But that's an interesting test for both teams. Walton hosting St. Pius next Tuesday. That's a 5.30 kickoff. We have a 6 versus 7 matchup on the 7A girls side of things coming up Friday night. Forsyth Central hosting Denmark. Forsyth Central ranked number 6, Denmark ranked number 7. That is a really really interesting game Friday night. I don't have the kickoff time. Uh, scoreboard.com it's listed as 10:55 p.m. I don't think it is going to be an 11 p.m. kickoff. Maybe it is the second game of the doubleheader that night. 
could be 555 as well. But Forsyth Central hosting Denmark Friday night. Big six versus seven matchup in 7A girls. Wanted to mention another one on the boys' side. Let's go over to 4A. Perry, one of the surprises this year, 13-1-1 out of Region 2 and 4A. They've got a big matchup coming up Friday night. It's going to be 7.30. Perry is hosting and they will be hosting the Spalding Jaguars, who are 9-3. and three. This is a very important region game between the two for positioning. Perry, perfect record in the region so far, 8-0, 9-0 in the region. Spalding, 6-2. Probably won't catch them, but to get a little bit of momentum going into the state tournament, the Spalding Jaguars trying to build that as they travel to Perry on Friday night at 7.30. Spalding, it doesn't get any easier for them. Tuesday, they host veterans. Perfect 15-0 for veterans. That's a 6A versus a 4A, but another huge test for Spalding. You get a couple of results there in those two. Final game of the season for the Jaguars will be at Griffin next Thursday. You get some results against two of the best teams in the state. Oh, things look really interesting for the Jaguars. And look, the the opposite is true as well. You have a couple of tough performances then getting up for the state tournament. That can be a real challenge. So Spalding, big tests coming up Friday at Perry, Tuesday hosting veterans. And one more game to keep an eye on. It's, it, I'll give you a week's notice on this one. In Midtown Atlanta, Midtown High School will be hosting Riverwood on Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. That's March 29th. Riverwood, 12-2. and two. They've won their region in 6A. They will be playing 5A Midtown, who is 10-3 overall. Really good matchup. Two teams, double-digit wins, Midtown and Riverwood. That is next Wednesday in Midtown Atlanta, 8 p.m. kickoff. So many other games to talk about. Next week on Soccer is in session. What we are going to try to do is take a look at the brackets for the state tournament as they currently sit and maybe how they could change in a few spots. Sometimes moving from second to third in a region or fourth to third can dramatically change the potential pathway to a state championship. Really excited to get on that road to McEachern and to Mercer in Macon. Uh, Looking forward to being on the call for the games down in Macon this year for NFHS. We'll be there Tuesday through Friday, the first week in May. Going to be fun. Going to be partnered up with uh, Luke Winstall, who called games with last year at the state championships. Going to be a fun time. Got a lot of soccer to be played before we get there, though. And soccer is in session. We'll get you ready every step of the way, thanks to our friends at Kaiser Permanente. Thank you to Kaiser Permanente for supporting soccer down here and helping us cover soccer all over the state of Georgia. That'll do it for us this week. Thank you to everybody for listening. We will be seeing you at a soccer field near you next week. And soccer is in session. We'll be back with you on Wednesday night. Mucha plata, y'all.